Space. I'm your host, Beck. In this episode, we will be talking to John Lim. John is a lawyer and geopolitical analyst by day. And being involved in the geopolitical arena, he's a great guest for today's episode on the space ecosystem in South Korea. He works for the Australia Korea Business Council, is a young leader fellow of the Pacific Forum, a space law and policy group member for the Space Generation Advisory Council, and a lot more. In this episode, we'll be talking to John about his involvement with the Space Law and Policy Group at the Space Generation Advisory Council, or SGAC. The South Korean space ecosystem and the current geopolitical climate in the Korean Peninsula. So let's get cracking. Hey, John, how's it going? Good, thanks. Uh, so before we start, I was just wondering if you could introduce yourself to us here at Climate Space. Sure thing. So my name's John. I'm a lawyer and geopolitical analyst who has provided astute policy insights on Asia Pacific affairs, international space law, and Korean affairs. I am a Young Leader Fellow with Pacific Forum CSIS, a member of the Space Generation Advisory Council, and former East Asia Fellow with Young Australians in International Affairs. Cool. Uh, so how did uh, how did you uh, get into international relations and political rest? Like what drove you into that sort of space? Sure. So I suppose it started with in high school doing international relations as a secondary school subject. After that, I did my bachelor's majoring in international relations, and I just found the whole field rather fascinating, given my desire to keep myself informed of what's going on in the world, my desire to meet and work with people from diverse backgrounds, and also my general interest in political risk. Okay, maybe for some some of us who doesn't know, what exactly does, I guess, political risk associate? Is it quite... Qualitative, quantitative, or a bit of both? So it's a sort of mixture of both. Political risk embodies the relationship between international affairs, business, and financial matters. It seeks to sort of predict possible uh, policy and business changes, which could result from political and economic events and decisions. So Mm -hmm. it hopes to promote greater stability and certainty for policymakers and businesses in their decision-making. Right. Okay. And so you said you work with the Space Policy Working Group at uh, Mm -hmm. SGAC, uh, Space Generation Advisory Council. Uh, So what are the sort of main issues in that working group and like, what are you working on right now? Sure. So the way that the SGAC works is that it is a volunteer-based international youth organization and network for students and young professionals interested in the space industry, founded in 1999. And it can't, it's currently celebrating its 20th anniversary. We have about 15,000 members across the globe and uh, with each country having a designated um, NPOC. So, and underneath that, there is the Space Policy, Space Law and Policy Project Group, which yeah. seeks to address the legal and political issues associated with space technology and geopolitics as well. So at the moment, it's currently headed by Mr. Thomas Cheney, And the way the group works is that it encourages and assists its members in their research work or in general collaborative projects between our members, including recommending contributions to journals Mm -hmm. for group projects and involvement in international conferences and seminars. So, for example, the group was represented at the annual sessions of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space at the United Nations, yeah. at the International Aeronautical Conference, and at uh, the SGAC Asia Pacific Space Generation Workshop. And so one of the projects which I'm working on at the moment, sort of a mixture of uh, individual research and collaboration with SGAC is to explore how human rights fits into the idea of human habitation in outer space. Yeah. How, as you can see with established human rights uh, instruments, you know, here with the United Nations, you got the ICCPR and uh, the International Convention on Social, Cultural and Economic Rights. Okay. And it sort of 
the question is, how do you extend that to human habitation in outer space, particularly with, say, we already know we have the rights to water established in uh, international customary law and with the United Nations. But when you go down to space, there's an inherent um, sort of deficiency in the amount of resources out there. Yeah. So the question comes in, say, if you if you want air, is air an essential human right? We know that's not really a question here on Earth, but yeah. in outer space, everything weighs a lot, everything costs yeah. a lot. And there's the question is, will air become a essential human right? Yeah, I can, yeah, I can see that like an issue in the future. Yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah, you don't really get to think about that. Uh, <laughs> Staying here on Earth. Yeah, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so um, I guess let's talk about space in Korea. Like what, I mean, what what kind of like market is it? Like is it predominantly a, a public a domain or is there commercial activity? Is it like what kind of percentage are we looking at? So at the moment in South Korea, as yeah. of 2019, the local space industry amounts to about uh, 2.7 trillion won, which yeah. is about uh, 2.4 billion US dollars a year. Mm-hmm. Um, of the 40 or so nations with space budgets, less than $1 billion, mm-hmm. five have indigenous launch capability. This includes South Korea, okay. where the prime space agency known as the Korea Aerospace Research Institute, or CARI, mm-hmm. had a budget of about 600 million in 2019. Mm-hmm. So it's a the indigenous space industry is sort of uh, I suppose led by the government who sets policy and then sort of attempts to collaborate with the local space startups as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, how like w- are there any notable South Korean space um, uh, startups at the moment? At the moment, it's mostly research institutes okay. like the you know, Korean Aerospace Research Institute or the Korean Astronomy and Space Science Institute, which are building are building a lot of the satellites yeah. and the launch vehicles. But right. uh, there's been an issue in South Korea with collaboration between the private and commercial sectors. So there's not really a established commercial startup yeah. space sector in South Korea at the moment. Okay. Um, so I, I guess what are sort of the challenges in, in the space ecosystem over there, there um, you know, for both public and private companies or public entities and private companies? Mm. So just starting off with that, it's that South Korean economy is primarily geared to, say, the IoT heavy industries and high tech sector. And space is sort of lagging behind with that. So when you think of South Korea, you usually think of giant conglomerates called tables, including, say, Samsung, LG, those sort of companies. And they're not really have their hand in the space sector at the moment. So one key challenge is... um, Creating a commercial space infrastructure, yeah. including a reliable domestic launch vehicle and a space spot for commercial space sector. Yeah. This was uh, illustrated on uh, the latest rocket launch in South Korea was uh, no, from South Korea was on December of last year, 2018, mm-hmm. when South Korea launched a Chol- what was na- named the Cholian 2A satellite mm-hmm. from Guyana at the cost of 63 to 72 million from yeah. uh, to French company Ariane Space. Yeah. And then there's another challenge which is coming up is in, is like I mentioned before, the lack of cooperation between the, between CARI and the private industry over the past decade. Yeah. And a third challenge is also adhering to the geopolitical climate mm-hmm. and how certain actions could impact on relations across the Korean Peninsula. Yeah. Say, would a rocket launch, would an increased pace of rocket launches from South Korea legitimize or encourage North Korea's actions? Right, okay. So just to, um, I guess, go back to the, uh, slightly at the start of the, the question was, um, so you said South Korea's, most of South Korea's industries are, you know, like companies like 
that are in uh, software and electronics and IoT kind of space. Is there a reason why they're not investing or they're part of the space um, and investing in that space ecosystem? Is it, you know, like there no business opportunity or is it just uh, there's like, like you mentioned, like the infrastructure? I think it's just a lack of political will. Right. I mean, just like with how you see it in the US, people often question, why do we fund NASA? Yeah. Was these space projects necessary? Yeah. So going back to that, CARI was founded in 1989. Yeah. And this, this sort of space development process in South Korea is driven by the 20-year National Space Development Program, started in 1995. Mm -hmm. So it was revised in 2000 and 2013. Yeah. One of the major achievements of the South Korean co space program, its first achievement actually, was the successful launch of a rocket to orbit mm -hmm. in 2013. The rocket was the NARA-1. Yeah. And then you also have, as with any space program, you have the mil military perspective as well, yeah. where the military, you see the military trying to encourage the government to expand its space-based asset as a means of through a kill chain program as a kind of strike capability to destroy potential North Korean missile and nuclear assets in the event of a conflict. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So um, I guess in terms of the local ecosystem, how does, I guess, the South Korean Space Agency um, sort of uh, invest in the local community and like to is there a lot of investment like i don't know education or and what is it kind of what's its kind of uh, focus for the next you know like five years and beyond hmm. at the moment south korea is pursuing a general uh, a space program which could defend the korean peninsula while lessening overall dependency on the u.s seeking to achieve i suppose a more partnership level relationship yeah with major space players. So you got Kari, which is planning to develop launch vehicles with local companies by 2021, okay. launch 1.5 ton satellites with them from 2023 onwards. And it's planning also to achieve lunar landings in 2030 yeah. for space space probes and small satellite launches abroad in by 2031. Yeah. You see also greater collaboration with space partners like the US. Mm -hmm. So this year, in on May 7th, the Korean Astronomy and Space Science Institute signed a memorandum of understanding for co-development of the payloads for civilian US uniland, lunar landers with NASA. Yeah. So overall, there's a desire to for the space for the Korean eco, space ecosystem to emulate the US and Russia in shifting the emphasis of space development towards the private sector. Yeah. So this will build upon their ICT and IoT achievements in retooling such industries and technologies towards space applications. So the government sees space technology as an industry that will spur the country's economic and technological competitiveness moving forward. We can already see progress has been achieved through as previously mentioned, the launch of Cholian 2A yeah. from Guyana. So that satellite, which was launched in December of 2018, yeah. was designed, assembled, tested, and transported based on South Korea's indigenous technologies. Yeah. Whereas if you look to the previous Cholian 1 satellite in 2010, yeah. that was based mostly on French technology. Okay. So there's an increased yeah. investment in that. And yeah. secondly, also an increase in political backing since the Park geun administration came to power since 2012, which has resulted in the increased amount of funding for CARI from 194 million in 2013 to 583 million in 2015. And it's sort of been staying around the $600 million level ever since. Yeah. Okay. So compared to like, um, I guess, South Korea's neighbors, like the, how would you compare it's sort of space endeavors. Mm. So as a developed OECD country, South Korea has made 
major developments with yeah. regards to its launching of uh, indigenous sunlight in 2013, the NARA one, but it's not to the extent of, uh, say, like Japan under the Japan Space Agency, JAXA. Yeah. So the first Korean national in outer space actually was on April 8th, 2008, when astronaut Yi Su Yon was launched aboard a Soyuz TMA-12 with two Russian cosmonauts as part of a mission to the ISS. Yeah. At that time, the South Koreans did not have a launch vehicle capable of placing a person in orbit. Yeah. So the government paid the Russian uh, government $20 million for each space flight. Yeah. And uh, at the moment, the South Korea, however, does have a significant amount of payload in orbit. Mm -hmm. Say so the leading number in the Asia Pacific is China with 308 yeah. payloads in orbit at the moment, followed by Japan at 90, India at 62, and South Korea at 16. Yep. Um, all right. So um, I guess let's. I guess uh, geopolitics would play quite a bit when it comes to airspace. Um, so just we'll shift a bit to that. Um, with Trump and everything going on right now in the peninsula, what is the current state of affairs there? And like, how is that, is that affecting like, you know, yeah, the space ecosystem? So it all sort of goes back to about 2017 yeah. when uh, their last launch of an ICBM by North Korea was in November of that year. And then following that, um, there was sort of the detente you noticed during January 2018 onwards between Kim and Trump. Yeah. This led to the Kim's announcement to the end of nuclear missile testing on April uh, 20th of 2018. And then after that, we had the various inter-Korean summits, the Singapore summit, the Hanoi summit, and so forth. However, things sort of suddenly start started to pick up in uh, May of this year mm -hmm. when uh, North Korea decided to start testing again with regards to not ICBMs necessarily, but uh, um, MLRSs, so medium rocket, sorry, medium rockets, medium range rockets, and uh, as well, uh, short range ballistic missiles. Yeah. And since then, we've seen about, about six tests since 4th of May 2019. Yeah. However, it's not, it hasn't been uh, clear as to this sort of a political argument at the moment with regards to what sort of rockets were being launched because whether or not it adheres to Kim's promise in 2018 to end nuclear and missile testing. Yeah. So the launches which have been going on over the past since May has been these medium range, short range ballistic tests, these rocket tests. And there's an argument as to whether these are rockets or uh, ballistic missiles, with North Korea stating that these are rockets and it doesn't go against its agreement to end missile testing. Yeah. Whereas the US, South Korea are arguing on the other side, saying that these are in fact ballistic missiles and you've gone against UN resolutions and they're just trying to put on additional sanctions as a result of that. Okay. All right. So, um, um, like, how much of the geopolitics between North and South, like, affects a lot of things with, you know, aerospace and, um, and you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah, the that kind of ecosystem as such? Mm -hmm. So, it's, I suppose it's sort of a political pressure on South Korea, when you have North Korea who has these big RCBMs yeah. and uh, all these multiple rocket launches going on so often, and you see South Korea with its, which has about say 50 times the GDP, but has a lacking space and uh, weapons program in that regard as in comparison. Is, is that because and, it's historic, sorry to jump in, but is that because historically They've always been relying on the U.S. for that defense sort of capability? Yes. So uh, at the moment, the U.S. maintains about, I believe, 25,000 troops in yeah. South Korea. Yeah. And the U.S. has been the primary security guarantor for South Korea since the Korean War ended in 1953. So 
with regards to that. Yeah, so how, how's like Trump's sort of um, coming into the picture effect? Is it changed or is it relatively the same? As so I think Trump's things? moving back to what sort of Richard Nixon did with the Nixon Doctrine, sort of withdrawing U.S. over involvement for mm-hmm. defense yeah. in its various part of the countries, with its fact Europe, throughout Asia as well, and sort of putting like America first, obviously, yeah. and. Uh, mm-hmm. As a result, there's been an increased amount of discussion within the community with regards to how do we posture ourselves to for to have our own defense yeah. going forward if the US isn't around and if China becomes more resurgent in the region. Right. Okay. Right. All right. So um I guess um uh, a lighter question <laughs> um, is, yeah, can you recommend like, you know, some kind of media, like either book or podcast or YouTube playlist or anything um, to listeners about, you know, like uh, either space or geopolitics or anything related mm. to, you know, South Korean culture or politics? Yeah. Mm. Or anything else? Uh, for those interested in current affairs across the Korean Peninsula, I'd recommend the news website, The Korean Times, or Yonhap News Agency. And then for those interested in uh, what's going on in North Korea with regards to understanding the political structure, there was a book published in 2012 by a guy called Victor Cha. It's called The Impossible State, North Korea Past and Future. And it sort of outlines what Pyongyang is looking for with regards to its nuclear missile tests that Mm -hmm. it's the goal is not just U.S. acknowledgement of its right to keep nuclear weapons, but also a U.S. guarantee not to attack North Korea again and a pledge to protect the Kim dynasty rule. Okay. All right. So um, so before we conclude, like, if listeners want to reach out to you, where can they find you? I think so. I'm contactable via my LinkedIn page. Yeah. Uh, just my LinkedIn page. Just search for the name John Lim. Uh, you can also add lawyer as well to the end of that, and I should turn up there. Yeah, and you can just yeah search for my through my various connections with the Young Australians in International Affairs as well, and with the Pacific Forum as well. So yeah, all right, cool. Yeah, that sounds that was an interesting conversation, especially with the current geopolitics around that region. Uh, it was lovely having you here. Um, so yeah, thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. John. No worries. Thanks for having me. So folks, that was John Lim. If you'd like to get in touch with him, he is available on LinkedIn. I'll put up all his details on our blog for this episode. Uh, next month, we'll be talking to Laura Keogh, the national point of contact for Ireland at the Space Generation Advisory Council. We'll get some insight into the Irish space ecosystem, a summary of the current legislations in data, tech, and space policies in the country, and her thoughts based on her experience as a lawyer in that domain. If you've made it all the way to this part of the show, then a really big thank you. We appreciate the time you've taken to listen to this episode and hope you provided some informative content. If you'd like to hear more or suggest how we can improve, please leave us some feedback on our website or get in touch via Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. If you can please share the episode with your friends and colleagues, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts as this would really help people find the show and grow the audience. Until next time, see you all later.